not believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Friends and family of Jim Nyholm, uh, we gather together today to celebrate his life, to find comfort in this time of grief, and to express the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, who has come and become one of us, who went to the cross to die for us, and then broke its power <coughs> by his resurrection from the dead. So this is not the end. It is the beginning for Jim and is a testimony for us to put our hope in Jesus Christ. And we're going to sing a duet that will lead us in the song which establishes where our hope is placed in Jesus Christ alone. And then we will sing a hymn in Christ alone, the words of music are found in the answer to the gold.
Adams, Minnesota. His favorite stories of his youth centered on Washington High School and University of Minnesota hockey and experiences at the family cabin on Sugar Lake. Eileen likewise shared these memories since their friendship began at age 12. He grew up surrounded by a large base of extended family and friends. Following graduation and marriage to Eileen on June 30th, 1964, he was employed by Reynolds Metals Company in Minneapolis. His career moved him to Richmond in 1967 and thereafter to Wichita, Kansas, Anaheim, California, Lenexa, Kansas, Baldwin, Missouri, Clayton, California, Bartlett, Illinois, and back to his favorite place in the world, <laughs> to Midlothian in 1988 to finish his career at Reynolds headquarters. Moving coast to coast, his family enjoyed a wonderful experience of meeting new friends and exploring the country. Jim was a member of Campus Crusade for Christ in his early years at the University of Minnesota. He was an active member of Gideon's International and Sycamore Presbyterian Church, where he served as elder in the choir and men's chorus and on the missions committee. From 2000 to 2005, he served as facilitator of Development for Mission America, a collaborative outreach ministry. His keen interest in missions included trips to Ukraine and Mexico. His assistance to the Kiev Symphony Orchestra and Chorus in their stateside travels reflected his love of music and missions. In his last year, he served as a nursery worker where he was loved and adored by the little children. I'll tell you a little bit about that. We have an ESL, English as Second Language program in uh, our church on Tuesday mornings. And there was one little child that looked for Jim. And without Jim, cried the whole time. <laughs> and with Jim, it just settled down. And there was a, a morning that Jim was not able to be here. And there was nobody that could calm that child down. And I finally came out of my office, and I don't ever do this. And I was thinking, what's wrong back there? And somebody's walking up and down the hall with this child, and I took this child into my arms, and maybe the male voice or something reminded him of Jim. Quiet it down. And I couldn't let go. The next half hour, 40 minutes until ESL was over. I really appreciated Jim being here <laughs> on those mornings. But it meant something that in, it, when his uh, abilities were fading with his disease, he found a niche of service that was just in, invaluable. Where was I? <laughs> From 2004 to 2007, he and I lived at Lake Anna and were members of Waller's Baptist Church. His family has priceless memories of annual reunions at the lake, spending time together swimming, water skiing, fishing, and s'mores around the fire. His trips to foreign countries with his children and their spouses continue to be a source of great joy. And Jim is survived by Eileen, his children, Brad, and Barbie, and Mark, and their families, 10 uh, grandchildren, and many of us as friends, a more extended family uh, than can even be here today, including his, his mother. As we celebrate Jim's life, uh, I've asked the family if they would want to put uh, personal expression and reflection to that. And uh, I'm going to read some things uh, on behalf of uh, Mark and, and Brad and, and Barbie uh, that. Uh, it really is, is their expression. Uh, you can understand how it can be hard to do personally uh, at this time. But I want you to hear it really from their mouths. The first uh, mark. Loving, caring, warm, generous. These are all words that describe my dad and the person that you all know. 
I also grew up knowing that my dad was awesome, an awesome role model. He was a world-class athlete. I asked Mark, what was the pinnacle of his career? He said he was captain of the University of Minnesota hockey team. Now, for those of us that knew Jim in his later life, I never pictured him gut-checking somebody against the boards. But to play hockey at that level, I'd be scared. No, I think he got all of his aggression out in those days. He's always encouraging me to push the envelope. He actually had me water skiing at age two, riding his shoulders. Playing hockey was a highlight, and he was thrilled to watch my son compete in high school and college level hockey. My dad never stopped loving him or caring for all of his family and looked forward to our visits and annual reunions. The greatest joy was his family, and he taught us invaluable lessons in compassion and love. Barbie read this. He said, since I was a small child, child, I remember my dad saying to me, good, Barbie, good. He was an incredibly encouraging, loving, and patient father. He taught me so many things. He never rushed or got annoyed. These were in post-hockey days. <laughs> he really enjoyed the process. He taught me how to water ski and to love lakes. I hear his voice. Good, Barbie. Good. He taught me how to play tennis, ice skate, love God, and music. We played together, piano and flute. I hear his voice. Good, Barbie. Good. He gave me a desire for adventure and travel by moving us around the country, visiting interesting places and people he loved. After moving to his favorite city, Richmond, I got a job with his favorite company, Reynolds Metals. <laughs> I married Pete and gave him four grandchildren. He became Poppy. I hear his voice. Good, Barbie. Good. And this for the sake of everyone else, Barbie acknowledged. He also would say, good, Mark. Good. Good, Grandma. Good. <laughs> I always knew he loved me and was proud of me. I knew he loved my mom our family. His faith would never waver. He took every opportunity for a big bear hug and a big smile. He would look me straight in the eye and tell me, you are so precious to me, or you are a treasure. It is hard not hearing those from him anymore. I can hear them loud and clear in my mind see his warm smile, and feel his strong grip on my arms. I will always miss him and treasure the memories. He will continue to encourage me until it is my time to hear the words he has already heard, well done, my good and faithful servant. As I meet our Savior, somehow I picture my dad standing very nearby my Heavenly Father saying, Good, Barbie. Good. If I fumble the reading, it's because there's no way the kids could have read this. I'm having a hard time keeping my eyes open. This is from Brad. My dad was the most generous and humble man I've ever known. We, the family, this week have spent the week together at Lake Anna just as we have most summers since 1997. This year was different. There's an empty chair at the dinner table, an empty seat on the boat, an unused noodle, and floppy sun hat on the shore, and extra bananas in the fruit bowl. <laughs> but at every turn, I see his face. I see him setting up the grill for dinner, I see him playing Legos with my sons. 
I see him clapping and cheering the Blondie's show. And I hear him yell, Yeehaw! When Ben and Jessica learned to waterboard yesterday. Ben and Jessica, I learned to waterboard this summer. <laughs>
among Jim's names. And it's uh, a New Testament that he was given by his church on Palm Sunday, April 6th, 1952. There's an inscription in the front that says, Jimmy Nyholm, as this gift is for being first in Sunday school class, I don't know what it means to be first in Sunday school <laughs> class. The first there, the best attendance record, learning memory for whatever it means. Um, I do understand the rest of it. As this gift is for being first in Sunday school class, may this book be first in your reading and Jesus Christ <coughs> first in your heart. First Presbyterian Church. In the back of this little Bible, August 8th, 1954, two years later, so Jim had kept up with this for two years, he wrote, I knelt at the altar of Medicine Lake under the preaching of Dr. Paul S. Reese. He preached on the first commandment I found peace with the Lord and want to live a life pleasing in His sight. Twelve years old, James Wallace Nyman. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Jim did. And the promise that comes with it is that so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now this eternal life is hard won. Not by us. You know, it, it could be in, in all the celebration of, of, of Jim's life and, and uh, reflections on these we it, at, at funerals, it's like everybody's a good person at their funeral. Jim really was. But that's not the reason he's in heaven today. That's the fruit of God's work in his life. I'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate. For why is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction? And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. These are sober words at a funeral. We declare with confidence Jim's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we declare with confidence where he is right now. But we have a message to proclaim to others because it's not automatic. It's not just whenever someone dies because it makes us feel better, we project a hope of heaven. Something happened in history to make this possible. And Jesus here says that there are only a few that find that. Our culture finds it quite obnoxious when Christians say Jesus is the only way to God. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father but by me, that is seen as a, 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 an obnoxious attitude, a reason to reject Christianity. But I would propose to you, if any of you who are here, I know that, that uh, one of Jim's great desires for you would be that you would know Christ as he did. So I kind of want to make it, make it plain. There was a man who struggled so much with this idea that there was only one way to God. There was only one way, uh, and that is through the cross. And that man himself was in such agony over this. He sweat as though dropping great drops of blood. It was Jesus himself. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew the cross was before him. And in his human nature, he knew the suffering that would be involved in his sacrificing himself to pay the penalty of sin. And in his human nature, he cried out to the Father and said, Father, if there be any other way. He didn't want there to be only one way. 
He didn't want this to be necessary. It wasn't a sinful reaction. It was actually a human and holy reaction that he would dread the cross. He was subject to all the pain, all the, the issues of it. But he did not abhor the cross. He said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And by the end of his prayer, he was saying, Father, glorify thy name. And he was prepared to go to the cross to make that payment, which alone covers our debt and our sin. You see, it's not a narrow thing to say Jesus is the only way to the Father. It is the expression of good news that apart from him, there would be no way to the Father. But he went to the cross out of God's great love for us. To pay the penalty of sin and open the doors of heaven wide for all who believe in him. That's why it's so important. Can you imagine if last year someone had come up and said, we have found a cure for Alzheimer's. And it's the only cure that exists. With the Nihon family, we have said, how narrow to say it's the only cure that exists. <laughs> we would say, really? There's a cure? Well, that's the way it is spiritually. If there's anyone here who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I call you today. Run to Him. This is good news. There is a cure for our sin and separation with God. The whole Bible was written that we would believe in Jesus Christ and that believing in Him we would have eternal life. It gives us a future. It gives us a future uh, even in the face of death. The second passage in uh, the bulletin. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That's 1 Corinthians 15. I'd like to add to it a corresponding passage in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians 4, 4, Paul writes, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. It doesn't mean that we don't grieve, but we don't do so with despair because we have hope. <coughs> we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. 